Okay, what I want to do for a few minutes tonight is talk real briefly about canonical sections, um, more specifically where the ellipse comes from. I want to talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of the ellipse and how uh, it re all that relates to Kepler's laws. Um, this is a very incomplete introduction, but it's enough um, for at least my classes uh, for the information that I want them to know. Now, <clears throat> Now, the term canonical sections basically comes from the idea of a cone. And typically, if you ask people about what a cone is, an ice cream cone comes to mind, which is really not that far from what I really want to talk about, except I'm not interested in all that ice cream, which does look kind of good. I'm just interested in the cone. And that's exactly what we're looking at, the cone. And that's, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about canonical sections. So, a cone is a 3D shape. A circular cone has a circular base. Now, I understand the base is typically on the bottom, and I have my base up. That's okay. Um, and then this base tapers to a point, which is called an apex. That's what a circular cone is. We're primarily interested in a right circular cone. Basically, a line from the apex to the base is perpendicular to the plane that that base is in. That's what a right circular cone refers to. We're going to take this cone and we're going to cut it into sections. Circles, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas, they're all mathematically related because they're referred to as a canonical section. If you take a plane and slice a cone at various angles, you're going to get one of these four shapes. A straight horizontal um, cut. So basically a circle is it's perfectly per, um, parallel to the base. And it's, so in this case that, that plane is, is horizontal. That's going to give us a circle. If we angle the plane a little bit and if we cut it through like that then we're going to have an ellipse. A bigger angle is a parabola and if it's basically straight up and down that's going to give us a hyperbola. These four shapes have similar mathematical equations when you try to graph them. That's not a coincidence. This is where it comes from. I am going to spend some time talking about the ellipse. Okay. So basically an ellipse is a squashed circle. And I like to refer to it as being oval-ish. There's a couple of critical dimensions associated with the ellipse. One of them is the semi-major axis. And the other one is the semi-minor axis, and we're going to refer to these terms um, as we talk about the ellipse uh, tonight. Now, this is almost a little bit of a chicken or the egg syndrome. A lot of times, the, the focal points or the foci will, and where they are will define the size and the shape of the ellipse. I'm approaching it a little bit backwards. I'm kind of defining the ellipse and then saying, hey, inside the ellipse are these two points. Now, what makes these two points unique is that the distance from any point on the ellipse to the two um, focal points, the sum of that distance, so the sum of D1 and D2, is going to be the same no matter what point on the ellipse that you're at. So now we are, we're at a different point and we have D3 and D4 and basically the distance D1 plus that distance D2 is a constant value that's equal to D3 and D4. That kind of defines the location of the focal points. Conversely, you can set up the focal points and then draw the ellipse around it based on this criteria. A couple equations associated with the ellipse to be familiar with. If we want to draw an ellipse centered on the origin, there's our equation x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. a and b are the semi-major and semi-minor axes um, dimensions. Very similar to the equation for a circle. Again, not surprising. This is centered on the origin. If we don't want this um, e uh, ellipse centered on the origin, we make some changes here um, in the X and the Y and we make our adjustments there. <clears throat> the location for the focal point 
um, from the semi-minor axis can be calculated root a squared minus b squared. And that gives us this distance right there. The eccentricity, which is often referred to as the amount of ovalness, is that, that focal point length divided by a. Now, if the eccentricity is zero, we're talking about a perfect circle. The greater the eccentricity, the more ovalness we're going to see on the ellipse. The planets, for the most part, have a very low eccentricity. The Earth's ex eccentricity is like 0.02, so it's almost a circular orbit, but it's not quite. And, and that's what we see a lot of times with the planets. These terms are going to come up over the course of the next few weeks in class, and you kind of need to be familiar with it, especially when we do the, uh, the graphing lab, the planet and the comet graphing lab, you need to be familiar with these terms. All right, Johann Kepler. He was convinced that the planet orbits were circular. Now this goes back to Aristotle that said it was a geocentric universe. The Earth was at the center. <clears throat> Um, he said that all the planets' orbits were perfect, in perfect shape, which means they were perfectly circular. That's kind of interesting, and that introduces some issues that we won't get into right now. But Kepler believed that the, the planet orbits were circular. So he tried to fit Brahe's data into a circular model, and he almost got it done from Mars. He had... he was able to perfectly model Mars's orbit mathematically except for eight minutes of arc. Now eight minutes of arc is equivalent to Earth um, orbit time as a little over three hours in a year. So essentially what, what I'm saying is using Kepler's model he could perfectly plot the position of the Earth around the Sun except for three hours out of the year. His model fell apart for those three hours. That's pretty darn good modeling. But Kepler knew Brahe's data was better than that. And so he gave up the idea of a circular orbit and started pursuing other shapes. Here we, and so that's when he got into the ellipse. This is something that he developed. It took him years to come to this conclusion. Okay, Kepler's his first law. His first law is pretty simple. Each planet moves an ellipse around the sun. The sun is located at one of the focal points of the ellipse. This is why we talked about the ellipse a little bit a few minutes ago. So here's the Earth, uh, an example of the Earth's orbit, not nearly this elliptical. And we have the sun at one of the focal points the Earth is going around. This was discovered by trial and error. <clears throat> As I said, Kepler was a mathematician, not a scientist. He had no idea of the significance of these discoveries. All he knew was this is what the data showed. Kind of an interesting um, aspect. His second law. Um, a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Now what that's saying is as if the planet, if it takes a month to go from from here to there and it takes a, and if you take a month from another point in its path these areas are the same and that's again uh, the conclusion is something that that Kepler noticed through the mathematical data what it didn't occur to him or what it means is the planets do not travel at a constant speed it obviously travels faster when it's closer to the sun. That was horrible, sorry. When it's closer to the sun. Kepler didn't realize that or why, but it, it does. This was, now when, when, in order for Kepler to develop this incredible amount, and remember this is all by hand in the 16, late 1500s, early 1600s. And so a lot, incredibly difficult algebra trig work that was required to do this. What Kepler did not realize that this was the 
one of the first examples of a conservation law, conservation of angular momentum. And, and, and that was one of the, I, to me, this is one of the great um, aspects of, of this particular second law. His third law, which he considers his greatest achievement, relates a planet's period with its mean solar distance. So um, the planet's period squared divided by the, uh, the mean distance from the sun cubed, that's a constant value for all the planets in the solar system. <clears throat> so you plug in information for the Earth, and, and that's the same relationship that it would be for Mars, for Jupiter, for Saturn, as long as the period is expressed in Earth years. Um, and, and so this can, helps us tie two planets in a solar system together. Now, this only applies for objects orbiting the same central um, point. So in this case, in the solar system, it's obviously the Sun. This was, excuse me, this relationship, t squared over r cubed, was, was again, trial and error. He did different relationships. He considered this one of his greatest discoveries. <clears throat> I can kind of understand that because who else would have, this is just incredibly tedious work to come up with it. And then, not just to come up with this relationship, but then to show that it is a constant based on the data with the other planets. Okay, this was all I really needed to go over and, and kind of give you some background information as to the ellipse and how it ties into Kepler's law. Um, hope it was of some value.